Thank you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. He took half of my time, actually. <laughs> um, happy holidays to all. Uh, coming from a place where we are now at eighth inch of snow, um, I don't know how you celebrate holidays with no <laughs> shoveling. And I, I don't know. It's really weird. But anyhow, I've been told that you celebrate on the beach. That's bless your heart. Um, today, I have a packed, packed you know, agenda to s share with you. Uh, I'm assuming that most of you here, because you know either yourself or some of your relatives, friends are acquainted with this gluten business. There is a lot of fantasies, very few facts, and and you know again, I want to give you the perspective of our center that leave firsthand the history of the evolution of this gluten related disorder for the past 70 years. Um, you know, even if uh, this problem with gluten and specific celiac disease was described a long time ago, 2,000 years ago, there are reports from a Greek physicians that describe something that really relates to uh, celiac disease. The real story that links celiac disease to its instigator, a gluten, it's very, very recent and really can be dated, um, you know, 60 or 70 years ago, thanks to this fellow here. This is a Dutch pediatrician that made an unbelievable observation. And before that, the destiny of the people with celiac disease at that time were mainly kids, was not a great destiny. One third of these kids would not make it. That was the rate of mortality before that this individual will make you know, this observation. That the destiny of these kids was pretty, you know, uh, um, you know, how to say, not really great. So in other words, if a pediatrician would make the diagnosis, these kids would be brought to the hospital the hospital doctor said, yep, there is a chance that these kids will have celiac disease. Leave him or her here, come back in three, six months, and if he or she is still alive, you can bring that back home. And during these three, six months, these kids will be fed only and exclusively bananas. And that's the reason why they're called banana babies. After which they will be reintroduced gradually to normal food and so on and so forth. Nevertheless to say, who made it will hate whatever was yellow for the rest of their lives. <laughs> Uh, because that was not a walk in the park. What was the tremendous observation that this guy made was that, again, during World War II, where in real Europe, you know, uh, flour made with wheat was really not available. What typically they had potato starch wheat, uh, in the flour. Mortality went to zero. And research phase at the end of the war, when wheat was again available, to again back 30, 35%. So he supposed, he made the, the, the proposition that was gluten or wheat, whatever components was in there, that was the culprit of city disease. To prove that, he did a study that now will be unconceivable. He, he did a study with six, one, two, three, four, five, six kids, okay? N equals six. And uh, he um, recruited these kids, put them on a gluten free diet, showed that the symptoms went away. Then reintroduced gluten, and the symptoms came back. And that's how he made the link. And now, 70 years later, it still holds true that this is the heart and soul how we treat celiac disease. It's remarkable, the fact that this was done on, uh, on, on a study that now will be laughable. Now, fast forward to 2013. What we know about celiac disease is not anymore a food allergy or food intolerance as we believed before. It's truly an autoimmune disease. It's not a premises of kids. People all ages can be affected. It is not true that you have to be fair skin, um, blonde, and uh, been uh, first degree relatives of Santa Claus to have, you know, see the disease and live in North Europe. Uh, the bottom line, and this is a condition that can affect any age, any sex, any race, and, uh, you know, what is mumbling uh, that we didn't know and you're going to see, uh, you know, during the lecture can affect people really at any age, can start at any age. But what has been a tremendous, tremendous, you know, improvement in our understanding of this condition really was when this was moved from, again, an unspecific, you know, food intolerance to truly an autoimmune disease. And ever since became a sort of paradigm of autoimmunity. As such... You have to have some ingredients to develop the recipe of autoimmunity. And, uh, but what makes celiac disease really one of a kind is that the recipe is unique. We know about celiac disease stuff that we don't know about multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, or diabetes, even if you know the recipe is exactly the same. Where are the peculiarities? 
as any other autoimmune disease, there are at least two ingredients. Genes, many, that you're born with, that you're going to see in a moment. And peculiarity number one, there are some genes that are you know, present almost the totality of people with celiac disease, particularly these HLA genes, you know, this DQ2, DQ8. Uh, 98, 99% of people with the celiac disease has either or both, meaning that if you don't have that, you cannot develop celiac disease. No other autoimmune disease has such a huge penetrance of genes. And uh, the second peculiarity, we know the target. This strange protein is called transglutaminase, or TTG, that we use you know, in, in, in clinical setting because antibodies against this enzyme are the strongest red flag that gives a high level of suspicion that this individual may have celiac disease. But what really sets celiac disease apart for any other autoimmune disease is that it's the only one for which we know the instigator, thanks to the observation that pediatrician that I told before. We don't know what makes people sick with diabetes MS. We know undisputably that it's gluten the culprit. And so much so that if you go on a gluten-free diet, that is the landmark treatment of celiac disease, you prevent this interplay between the genes and the environment, and you completely revert the autoimmune process because these people will have no symptoms anymore. The antibodies that you use for you know, the diagnosis will go back to normal, and the damage of the intestine that is the only mark of the autoimmune insult is gone. So imagine the revolution in the world of science where you know, the prediction was once you got in the path of autoimmunity, there is no way of return. Celiac disease is teaching us otherwise. You will see in a moment what kind of repercussion that they have, meaning that if there is any way to in, in, impede this interplay between genes and environment, in this case by subtracting the environment, you can stop and revert autoimmunity. That's the impact that celiac disease really is having on the general world of immune-mediated diseases in general, specifically on autoimmune diseases. What was the outcome? What is the outcome when these two ingredients, they come together? Well, again, in tax, classical textbooks, um, this is the picture of a typical celiac, and that's what we have in mind for many, many, many years. Classical manifestation, uh, mainly a few weeks or a few months after that the environmental instigator, i.e. gluten, comes into the picture, so a few months after the gluten is introduced in the diet, with symptoms that are typical of what is described in the classical textbooks. Look very carefully at this picture of these kids with celiac disease. This is a picture of kids in the late 30s from London. These kids, they look exactly like the malnourished kids that we see nowadays in third world countries. They are absolutely the same. The difference is that the kids with malnutrition now, they look like this because they don't have food to eat. Celiac disease look like this. They have food at the wazoo, but cannot make use of it because we just go through them. That was the picture that we had in mind. And that's the classical. The big belly, the subcutaneous fat that's gone, failure to thrive, stomach ache, vomiting, uh, the, uh, irritability. By the way, this was a common denominator. When I was in training, my boss used to say, forget about the blood test, forget even you know, the clinical exam. You see the parents stress out with the air up in the air and the bag under the eyes. The kids is pissed off. That's the disease unless proved otherwise. <laughs> pissed off right there. Okay? For many years, we look in this direction. And that's the reason the premises, the, the general wisdom was, because we don't see this in the United States, celiac disease does not exist here. That was the premises. And then we learned that this was not what celiac disease is really all about. This probably was like this in the 70s. But nowadays, celiac disease is what we call a systemic disease. There is no organ or tissue of our body that is spared by the attack that is instigated by the introduction of gluten if you are genetically predisposed. True, the intestine is the battlefield where this war between our immune system and this enemy, I gluten, occurs. But guys, and this is something that I keep telling my students over and over again, the gut is not like Las Vegas. What happened to the gut does not stay in the gut. So once this instigator got there and these immune cells, the sort of soldiers that see the enemy and start to fight, and generate collateral damage that is inflammation, sometimes 
these soldiers, they, lie, they leave the battlefield, i.e. the intestine, and spread out. Any place in your body. Go to the skin, and you develop the skin manifestation as dermatitis of pretiformis. Goes to your teeth, and then you have this teeth discoloration. The, there is an, a, a problem and inflammation of the bones associated with the vitamin D and calcium deficit, and you develop osteoporosis, and I can go on and on and on. Matter of fact, contrary to the general wisdom, the most frequent way the disease presents it's, it's, itself nowadays is not diarrhea and 30 pounds weight loss. The most frequent way the disease presents today is anemia, and with that, chronic fatigue. Some people, they are diagnosed with fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome. They, this is the most frequent way that disease presents itself. And don't be surprised that this can happen because iron is absorbed in a very few inches to the very early part of the intestine. If that is gone, there is no backup. There is no other way to bring iron. And if you don't bring iron, you develop anemia. So you can have only this few inches damage. The rest is spared. The capability of the intestine to digest and absorb food stuff is untouched, but you develop these other symptoms. So that should be surprising. Bottom line, the reason why we overlooked for many years is because this is truly a clinical chameleon. If you don't know all the permutation that this disease you know, materialized and can present itself, chance exists that you would not make the diagnosis. So for many years, the lag period between the onset of the symptoms and somebody diagnosed with celiac disease was measured in a matter of 10, 12 years. 10, 12 years. Now we're much better, six or seven years. But we're talking about years, not months. Imagine if we would make that kind of slow journey for people that are you know, affected by diabetes or MS. These people would die because of you know, the fact that the diagnosis missed for such a long period of time. So, what are the milestones that really changed the landscape in the past, you know, uh, decade and a half? Starting from 1997, we realized that this recipe of celiac disease really called for three ingredients and not two, as we believed before. Sure, you have to have these three elements, the Holy Trinity, to come together in order to develop celiac disease. And then we realize that this applies to any other autoimmune disease with tremendous repercussion in terms of what we can do in terms of science to open the possible hope of a treatment for autoimmune diseases thanks to celiac disease that is leading us, hold it by hands, the knowledge of science to make that kind of, of, of you know, improvement. And let's take a look at these three ingredients. Genes, again, these are many genes involved. These are multifactorial diseases. There are several genes involved. Right now, we reach roughly 40, 45 genes that we know that are necessary to develop celiac disease, but probably we were talking the hundreds. The more we learn, the more we see that genes are involved there. One that I told you must be there is this HLA DQ2, DQ8. Almost the totality of people with celiac disease, they have either DQ2 and or DQ8. Now, this is absolutely necessary, but not sufficient. You have to have all these other pieces of the puzzle. And matter of fact, you know, one third of the general population, they have these HLA genes that they would never develop celiac disease. So that's, it's extremely complex matter that is, you know, object of a great level of interest in terms of science. The second element that we don't know until the recent past that's beside the genes and beside an instigator the intestine has to lose one of its key functions that's been overlooked for many years, i.e. the function of barrier, the function to divide ourselves from the environment, to avoid this promiscuous entrance of bad guys that can really harm us. And we didn't know about this until the recent past. Now, some of you guys have been hearing the leaky gut theory or whatever it is. Um, you know, it, 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 the bottom line is that, again, among the most important functions of the intestine is to regulate the trafficking of these guys from outside and then make choices. The good guys are nutrients that can come in. The bad guys are bacteria that can kill us and needs to stay out. That's pretty much you know, a simplistic way to look at the much more complex story. But what are the facts of this leaky gut syndrome? We know very little. We know, for example, that in the past, all the physiologists and we're talking about the past, meaning 15, 20 years ago, the gut was conceptualized as a sort of floor in which 
Each tile was one of these single cells that covered the entire 20 feet of uh, the intestine length. And in between the tiles, everything was sealed by a sort of grout, cement. So whatever communication was happened with, through the uh, you know, environment had to happen through the cell because in between cells, nothing would come through because everything was sealed. Now, how big of an interface we're talking about? This 20 feet, if you stretch on the floor, will cover a double tennis court. Huge. So you can imagine why nature put all this stuff in, in this little, you know, little space here. And there is a tremendous philosophical message that the biology is sending us. We want to interact with the environment. And the port of entry when we interact with the environment, the most important one is not the skin, that is one tenth of this, not the lung, that is one fifth of this, but this one here, because it's huge. 15, 18 years ago, a Japanese group came up with an, a, a, a revolutionary finding. They said there is no grout, there is no cement in between cells. There are doors, they are typically closed. But because they are doors, we can open them at will. And to allow on the tidally control, you know, a, you know, a mechanism, passage of stuff from the environment into our body. And over the years, we understood the complexity of these doors. And one, you know, information that was missing was what is the key that open and close this door? Until by serendipity, we stumble upon this molecule that some of you guys may have heard called zonulin. That that's exactly what it does for a living. That open and close these doors. And if these doors are stuck open, has you know, happened in many autoimmune diseases, as you see in a moment. So in other words, if you have a leaky gut, it's because this zone is produced too much at the wrong time. So rather than do this nice job of open and close, make this door to stay open for a long time. Long enough that you cannot discriminate anymore friend or foes, but everybody will come in. By the way, let me check. Am I going to hew with the science or you got, you know, what I'm talking about? No, because if you don't got it, I start all over again from the very beginning. We're going to finish at 9, 10. We understand it. You do. Wonderful. Because, again, otherwise this is going to be the price. When we found this zonolin and finally we understood what kind of molecule it was, we were able to identify the gene and where this gene sit in our, you know, you know, chromosomes, the chromosome being this, this piece of genetic material that really dictate who we are with the color of our eyes and our height and uh, our metabolism and so on and so forth. So the gene that encoded for zonulin sits on this chromosome that is called chromosome 16. Very small chromosome, account for roughly 3% of the old genes that we, we, we have, but very important because Many genes related to specific disease have been located in this chromosome, specifically three major uh, you know, uh, classes, autoimmune disease. So uh, genes, for example, for type 1 diabetes, lupus, uh, inflammatory bowel diseases like Crohn's, uh, rheumatoid arthritis have been sitting here. Uh, many genes for cancer, for example, breast cancer, uh, lymphoma, myeloid, leukemia, prostate cancer genes are sitting over here. And interesting enough, genes of the nervous system, uh, like Lou Gehrig disease, leukodystrophy, multiple sclerosis, autism genes are sitting on this chromosome. The gene for zonulin was discovered and sequenced in 2010, so three years ago. In three years, the scientific community was able to try to you know, define where this genes and therefore zone and therefore leaky gut is linked to in terms of diseases. And sure enough, the same kind of categories came up. So there are autoimmune diseases like celiac disease, Crohn's disease, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, diabetes, cancer, interesting brain cancer, particularly gliomas. There are a lot of studies now working on that. Breast cancer, lung adenocarcinoma, ovarian cancer, pancreatic cancer, all related to leaky gut due to zonulin, and finally some disease of the nervous system like MS and schizophrenia I'm going to touch upon briefly 
on these conditions toward the end of the chat. So you see how important it is really to tightly regulate how we interface with the environment and what are the consequences when this is not done right. And we learned this all thanks to our discoveries in celiac disease. The third element beside the genes that this better function is the environmental trigger. Interestingly enough, our species was not meant to eat gluten. That's the reality of the story. For the 2.5 million years of evolution, the humankind has been gluten-free for 99.99% .99 of the time. Gluten came into the picture only in the very last second of human evolution, 10,000 years ago, when our ancestors dramatically changed their lifestyle from nomadic, so in other words, moving around with the seasons of the crops and the migration of the animal to settlers, in which they start to domesticate food and crops, so that food procurement was not the main activity of humankind, but was predictable, and so they can spend you know, their time in much more creative stuff, like you know, to build you know, the, the pyramids and, and the Colosseum and so on and so forth. The, 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 the grains that contain gluten that belongs to this tribe of, of uh, grass family that are called already, so with dry and barley, they came up with the agriculture. So they did not exist. So in other words, we did not evolve to deal with gluten. It just was something that we did not plan. What are the consequences of this? Is that gluten is toxic for everybody, but not, listen carefully, because I know that somebody else, you know, you, you, there's a lot of confusion there. It's toxic for everybody, but not everybody eats gluten who got sick. That's the bottom line, and I will tell you in a moment why. So that's where agriculture started, you know, in Turkey and then moved east, west, and south, north at the rate of one kilometer per year, and then spread everywhere. And this was a very popular crop. In the ancient world of Egyptians and, and, and uh, Romans, um, the wealth was based on the availability of this, and the grains changed over time. So in other words, the old grains, the ones that the, the, the Romans used to eat, um, was this grain here, okay? The, the hill was very low. Then in the Middle Age, this grain came by. And roughly 400 years ago, this modern grain, the one that we still eat, came about 400 years ago. And for as far as we know, based on agronomists, from there, genetically, this grain never changed, are the same for the past 400 years. That's what we understand. But they became extremely popular. Uh, you know, making bread in Egypt was a great deal. Unfortunately, the first beverage that was really developed was not wine, as I want to believe, but it was beer. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think that who drinks beer is an unsophisticated drinker. But, you know, <laughs> Egyptians, they drank beer. And was developed before that the Romans really perfected, you know, the production of wine. And, and, and the wealth was not measured by stocks and bonds, or, uh, you know, because at that time there was not such a thing, but by how much grain and how much oil you own, because they were not perishable and you can do so many things with that. Okay, so that's the reason why grains containing gluten became so popular. Now, this is a painting of the 1500s. Look very carefully, this is a wheat field. Look at this gentleman here. You know, see how tall was wheat at that time compared to human beings. Sure, you know, the average a height at that time was not what we have today. But that was pretty much, you know, that was the typical height of grains at that time. The, 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 the seeds were only the 5% on the top. So the yield was not great, and the harvesting was once a year. And that's when the, you know, agriculture revolution and people that start to play with grains made, you know, this a much more efficient and increased yield. And the, this became shorter and 30% of the plant now are the seeds and the 70% is waste. But, but again, this is when this happened a long time ago, not 50 years ago. What is so special about gluten? Why is such a unique protein? 
first of all, when we talk about gluten, we talk a mixture of proteins, gluten, uh, glutenin and glidins, both toxic with people with celiac disease and other gluten-related disorders. What is so special is that, you know, this protein is extremely elastic and create, a, you know, when you mix with water and yeast, it creates a sort of chambers uh, in which air can be entrapped. So when you mix, you know, these ingredients, flour with wheat, water and yeast, this puffs and you have this beautiful croissant, the crashing bread, I mean, forget it, but you, you got the point. You try to do this with rice, it's not going to happen. But the beauty comes with the beast. Because that is the reason why gluten is so toxic. Being so elastic and so unique as a protein cannot be digested. So, again, I don't want to go on technicalities, but imagine a protein as a sort of pearl necklace. Each of these pearls is a basic component that we call amino acids. Any protein that we put in our mouth. In order to make use of it, we need to break the necklace first, cut in pieces, and then peel one amino acid at a time so that we can bring it in. We can do this for each, each protein that we put in our mouth with the exception of this one here. Due to strange composition, the best that we can do is to break it and make pieces. But we cannot completely dismantle you know, gluten in a single amino acid. When I say we, I mean human species, all of us. We don't have, in other words, the scissors that technically are called you know, enzymes, digestive enzymes produced by the pancreas or by the intestine to do this job. We don't. Now, it's also important to um, understand that you know, instigation of an immune response, in other words, when the immune system sees an enemy start to really fight and create this collateral damage that we call inflammation, it's mainly instigated by proteins or piece of proteins. So the fact that gluten cannot be completely digested and will have the capability to try through these two pieces here in blue to make the intestine leakier, it's a great instigator of inflammation. That's what it is. And, and again, it will be seen by the immune system as an invader that can create danger. And the immune system goes all in to get rid of it. Now, disclaimer, this happens in everybody. As a matter of fact, everybody that eats gluten will have a leaky gut. So you eat gluten, uh, gluten is digested, you know, incompletely. In we release this molyzolanin that will open this gate in between cells, and gluten will come underneath here. Now, here, the destiny is different depending on who you are. The vast majority of people will go after gluten, will clean it up, and we will not know that that happened. A very minuscule percentage of individuals will lose this bottle and will develop symptoms and will make these people to develop what, one of the gluten-related disorders that we're going to discuss in the last part of this chat. The other thing that is cool that we learned in studying all this process is that by mistake of evolution, gluten is interpreted by the immune system as a bacterium. So in other words, an invader that can really kill us. Now, we are surrounded by bacteria, and we fight against bacteria all the time. Very few of us will lose the bubble and would develop infection and fever and whatever comes with this. Same story with gluten. We all are eating gluten, no matter who you are. You live in the North Pole or you live, you know, the Ecuador, the same, that we all are exposed to gluten. We all will engage in this fight, but very few would develop problem with that. So this is an apparent dichotomy because you read out there, Google or books and so on and so forth, that we will be esteemed as a species if we don't eliminate gluten from our diet. And this is based on our, you know, discoveries that gluten is toxic for everybody. However, again, very few will lose this battle and very few will eventually get in trouble if we consume gluten for a long period of time. And other milestones that really change dramatically the landscape is the diagnosis of celiac disease. Now we have unbelievable tools, these blood tests that really are red flags that give a great level of confidence if you have a problem. Their sensitivity, i.e. to identify celiacs, no question, or specificity to identify only celiacs and not being falsely positive, people that have other problems other than celiac disease, is almost 
unparalleled in biology. It are formidable, formidable tools. And, and this is a great um, you know, you know, uh, tool that we have uh, in our toolbox, really, to make the diagnosis of celiac disease as a screening. Where we're going from here? Where is the next step? Well, these are the next steps that we're looking for. Diagnosis algorithms to make sure that you are absolutely uh, adamantly sure that you're dealing with celiac disease without doing the procedures that is quite invasive. There is the endoscopy intestinal biopsy. This was a dream no long ago. Now it's the reality. I'm going to talk a little bit about this. That is the most mind-blowing. I still can't get, you know, my arms around this concept. I to predict who's going to develop CD disease. And now we have the way to do that. And then we're going to touch a little bit about this host intestine microbiome interaction. I'm not going to talk about this because I don't even know how to pronounce it. So forget <laughs> about that. <laughs> Another milestone that we reached in 2005 was amazingly uh, uh, conceptualizing alternative or integrative treatment to the gluten-free diet. This was unconceivable until 2005. I don't have to explain this. This is pretty simple here. I just want to, you need to laugh what I just said, because it's, it's not simple, because I don't understand myself this. Um, but you look at these yellow dots here, 1 to 10. These are all steps that we didn't know until 10 years ago that are the chain of events that leads from the introduction of gluten to destroy the intestine and characterize city disease. And each of these yellow dots is a possible point that you can stop this chain of events so that you don't lead to celiac disease. What we do right now, we use step number one. I do not eat gluten. That's the only thing that we know how to do it. But all the others are pure theoretical steps. One that I want to really focus on is step number two. In other words, to stop the permeability of the gut by stopping this capability of zonulin to open these gates and make the gluten to leak from outside here and cause all this. Because if you can close these doors, everything downstream is becoming material because it's not going to happen. So that's pretty much what we've been working on for the past five years. And this is, again, because now we have the understanding, both through the genetic zone and also through clinical studies, that this leaky gut is a big deal. It's involved in many conditions. And again, this is by far not a complete list of conditions for which it's been clearly demonstrated that intestinal barrier function is jeopardized. It doesn't work anymore. So MS, stroke, schizophrenia, asthma, COPD, and you go down to the list, tumors, metastatic disease, you name it, okay? So now we have a way to measure zonulin in the blood of people. And interestingly enough, both in people with celiac disease and type 1 diabetes, the amount of zonulin is much higher than normal people that is down here. Okay? So that means that definitely there is something wrong in the production of zonulin that is exaggerated in people without immunity. So back to the recipe with three ingredients. If it is true that each of them it's absolutely necessary, meaning genes, environment, and this impairment of the mucosal barrier. It is also true that if you take any of the three out of the equation, you should prevent autoimmunity. Take the genes out is, is a theoretical proposition because there are too many. If they are still around, they must be important. We don't know them all, so that's not a proposition. Eliminate the environmental trigger is a proposition that is applies only for celiac disease because we don't know where are the triggers for the other immune diseases. What about if we correct this impairment of the mucosal barrier? In other words, if we fix the leaky gut and leave everything beyond, can we treat autoimmunity that way? And once again, celiac disease came to rescue because we develop a, a, a blocker, an inhibitor of zonulin. Let's say, going back to the parallel of the key, let's say that zonulin is the key. We develop a sort of wax that goes in the hole where the key needs to go. So because you can't engage in this hole, these doors cannot be commanded to be open. So you prevent the zone to really make this intestinal leak. And we use these molecules that now is in clinical trials in people with celiac disease. So these are people that eventually have been diagnosed with celiac disease and blindly are given gluten only, making them sick, or gluten plus this zone and blocker. And the question is, can you prevent the symptoms to come if you, rather than put these people on a gluten-free diet, you let them eat gluten, but make gluten not coming through because you block zonulin. 
Are you guys still with me? Yes. You met better than my students. What the heck? <laughs> all right. So this is the sum of almost 800 people, 800 people that got this blocker. In yellow are the people that got gluten only. In blue are the column of people that got gluten plus this uh, zone and blocker. And these are different symptoms of different trials, many GI symptoms. The message here, in other words, that if you eat gluten by itself, as suspected, you are in trouble in deep doo-doo. If you got gluten plus this inhibitor, most of the symptoms are you know, highly reduced or totally ameliorated. So proving that indeed, if rather than take gluten out, you fix the leaky gut, you achieve the same goal. Now, I can't conceptualize enough with importance the outcome of what we're doing here. Milestone number five. This, by far, is the most cool and unbelievable part of my chat. So forget about what I told you so far. This is it. We were absolutely convinced that you were born with celiac disease. So in other words, you're born with the genes, you eat gluten, it's destiny. There is absolutely nothing that you can do about it. And we were convinced that when the two come together, so when baby food is introduced, that's when the autoimmune process started. Now, some folks lose this battle right away and develop symptoms like you know, being a little kid. Other people, they lose this battle in 20, 30, 40 years and develop you know, celiac disease as adults. By the way, how many of you guys have celiac disease? All right. How many of you guys develop celiac disease after that you turn 20? 30? 40? I stopped there because otherwise then we'll figure out how old are you. <laughs> and by the way, I see, you know, um, the ladies' hands decreasing, uh, you know, when increasing the age. So <laughs> you're not being honest there. But anyhow. Um, so we did a study that was kind of interesting study with total different purpose in which we took 3,000 healthy adults and we followed them for 50 years. They are healthy. We reasoned that since 1% of these folks have to have celiac disease, that's the prevalence in the general population. So 30 of them has celiac disease, and we want to see over time how they would develop symptoms. We were mesmerized that in this group of people, celiac disease double every 15 years. One in 500 here, one in 250 here, one percent here. There were people that eat gluten for 56. There are two ladies for 70 years that were eating gluten, no problem whatsoever. And then something happened to them. They lost that capability to tolerate gluten, and they developed CD disease. So yes, you need genes. Yes, you need gluten. But they are not sufficient to lead to autoimmunity. So the question is, what are the tricks that these people, they are genetically destined, at least we thought, to develop CD disease they use to really tolerate what is the undisputable trigger of autoimmunity? And most importantly, what happened to them that caused the loss of capability to tolerate gluten and develop autoimmunity? Answer to this question will be the holy grail of primary prevention of God knows how many diseases. So that are the least of the possible causes. And again, I don't have the time to go through all of them, but this here, particularly the change of what we call the microbiome, that now it's become a buzzword, seems to be extremely important. So let me, let me try to conceptualize a, a, something that's quite difficult. We decide, because we are the big dog on the planet Earth, that we are the most sophisticated machine around. I don't know if you follow about the human genome uh, project, that all the genes that, that we have have been you know, resolved and so on and so forth. My self-esteem went to the bathroom um, when I realized that we are you know, genetically rudimental. We're made by only 25,000 genes. That's all. A worm, the one that we dissect in elementary school, has 90,000 genes. The plant of gluten, 150,000 genes. We're only 25,000 genes. And 99.5% identical to chimpanzees. I love chimpanzees. I work with them. Can work, can talk about politics or, you know, the weather here. <laughs> they do not respond. So how to explain the complexity of humankind? The only way is that we have to consider this parallel civilization that comes to us when we're born and will leave us where we die. That is this complex community of bacteria, the most complicated living in the guts that we complexly call microbiome, and in the totality, produce 100 times more genes than we do. So for the past 
three years of being preaching, uh, you know, around and being crucified head down, this concept, we are really made by two genomes. The human genomes that we're born with, that will never change, that we got from mom and dad, that is as defective genes that will make me a risk for celiac disease or brain cancer or prostate cancer or Alzheimer, will not go away. But the beauty of this is that the fact that I have these genes doesn't mean that I will develop it. If I do or do not, depend on by the second genome that we have, that is the microbiome, change all the time. That if we're lucky, we got from our mothers, because if this microbiome live in peace with my mother, most likely will live in peace with me as well because I have similar genes as she does. So if I'm born by vaginal delivery, I have three, four, three, four less chances to develop celiac disease if compared to C-section. Because if you're born by C-section, your risk is much higher. And the reason why is because all comers, bad guys or good guys from the hospital or from whatever you, know, you are, will come in from the skin of mom and so on and so forth. So I'm going to skip this because I, this is too complicated. We did a study to prove that the microbiome is important by taking a group of infant neonates at risk for celiac disease because some of the members of the family had it. And we follow our time. And we ask ourselves, does the microbiome really has to do with anything that happened to these kids, i.e. if they develop celiac or not? And the answer is yes. And what we realize, a very complicated concept that I try to make simple, is consider the human genome as a piano with 25, 30,000 notes, one for each gene. These notes will not give any sound unless somebody sits and plays the piano. And the piano player is the microbiome. So why the piano would never change? And if it has 300 notes that if they are stroke, they will play the celiac music, you can't trade in. That's a very expensive piano. But the microbiome, the piano player change all the time. And depends on who sits the piano, you have different music. <laughs> so if you have Elton John, for example, that can touch 200 of the 300 notes, Despite that you have the genes, the, the song celiac disease would not be played. But let's say that you have an infection. You undergo to pregnancy. You go to surgery. You have any stressors. In other words, any, or you take a trip somewhere. Anything that can change your microbiome. Now, rather than Elton John, maybe the Ray Charles is sitting in the piano. He can touch all 300 notes, and you play the song celiac disease at any age. This is what we call epigenetics. And how do we know this? Because we can listen to the music. So now we have the capability to listen to music that technically is called metabonome. So if I hear pop music, despite that I'm genetically at risk, I know that I'm safe because the good microbiome is sitting there. But if I, all of a sudden, I hear jazz music, I know that the wrong piano player is sitting there. This guy will lead me to celiac disease. Is that fantasy? No, no, this is the reality. This is, again, this proof of concept study. These kids develop celiac disease. These other kids develop di one diabetes. Both of them, months before that they lost tolerance to gluten, they're changing this metabolite. They picked and then dropped. A few months after they dropped, these people, they lost tolerance, and they developed autoimmunity. This is a handful of kids. Imagine if we can extrapolate the big numbers, what that means that we have the capability to predict who will, down the road, develop celiac disease, type 1 diabetes, Alzheimer, breast cancer, you name it, and then manipulate the microbiome so that the music will go back to the friendly microbiome that will be played. That is what we are trying to do right now. It's mind-blowing. If somebody would have told me three years ago that that's what we're going to do in the, in, in the lab nowadays, I would say, why are you smoking? Because I want a piece of that as well. So the real, and that's, the, I believe, the philosopher of this institute. I, I was mind blown to, to learn what these people, they do for a living. The best way to predict the future is indeed to create it. Um, I'm going to finish up. I have five more minutes, or, or do I not? No. I, I started at 6.10, so I'm taking, right? But we have, guys, disclaimer, 
either we go with 10 minutes of question or we go five minute question and wrap it up. Okay, five minutes of question. Okay, so bottom line, we learn that celiac disease is all the tip of the iceberg. This is the trend of the diet in the past 10 years. This is low carb, fat free, gluten free. Less than $100 million of, of market in 2003, 2004. From 2008 over, this became the, by far the most popular diet in the United States. By 2014, $10.2 billion in sale. Who the heck are these people? <laughs> they go gluten free. There is a fad factor for sure. No question about that. It's Lady Gaga go gluten free because she was losing weight, or you know, Oprah wants to cleanse her body. There are a lot of people that will follow this. Is this right, wrong? I don't know. For me, as a physician, I want to make sure that people that feel healthy, and if going gluten free, they feel healthy, go to go for it. There is no question about this. But definitely, there is a fad component. But cannot explain all this. The reality of the story that the gluten-free diet consumers can be divided in people that are gluten-free for medical necessity and the one that are occasional consumers. That, you know, they feel better when they go gluten-free. From the medical necessity, they are the celiacs, the autoimmune disease, the weed allergy that is a relatively small number, and then this third, you know, new kids on the block that we didn't know that is called not celiac gluten sensitivity or, celiac or gluten sensitivity. Very interesting. This is the definition. We don't know too much about this. It's by exclusion criteria because we do not have tests of this. So in other words, if you rule out celiac disease and weed allergy and you feel better gluten-free, if you feel sick when you reduce gluten, you are called gluten sensitive, right? as much as we know right now. And these are the typical symptoms. Stomach ache, eczema, headaches, foggy mind. I love this. I tried gluten-free, my mind remained foggy, so it didn't work for me. <laughs> Uh, fatigue, diarrhea, and so on and so forth. Um, so bottom line, this is what is the current classification. You can have an autoimmune reaction to gluten, so you have see the disease, an allergic reaction with allergy, or this third animal here is called gluten sensitivity. We have tests for the first two. We do not have tests for gluten sensitivity. They are validated yet, but people are working on it. I'm going to finish up with the most controversial question about gluten sensitivity. What gluten has to do with autism and schizophrenia? There is a lot of stuff that's going on there. And again, I'm not going to tell you about this. Uh, well, you ask me the question, I will answer, OK? <laughs> and finally, you know, the major milestone, how much gluten is too much? In who is, has been dealing with gluten for a long time know that this has been a milestone. In August 2013, finally, the Food and Drug Administration declare that 20 parts per million is the safe threshold for people that consume gluten-free products because they have a gluten-related disorders. Now, I, uh, I wrote this book that will come out in May 2014. It's called Gluten Freedom. What you heard and more will be in there. Um, you know, if you really are tackled and tickled and uh, curious about what I just said, you're going to find much more in there it took three years to write it, and I'm still, you know, maneuvering this. But again, what I told you in 47 minutes, <laughs> it is 17 years of a constellation of failures, and what you heard are only the few successes. Now, I am the ambassador who did all this. The real players are the number of individuals that have been working for me for many years that are totally dedicated to make your life better. And that's the model, and that's the, the, the purpose of our center. It was, it is, and it will be. Thank you so much. <laughs> Questions. If we want to make this efficient, ma'am, a quick question or a quick answer so we can really rock and roll. If you have a gluten sensitivity, can you develop Crohn's disease? Um, there are comorbidities with celiac disease and gluten sensitivity without inflammation like Crohn's disease. Uh, you can, uh, but it's not that it's a very strong. For example, we see comorbidities between celiac disease and diabetes, they're much stronger, or celiac disease and Hashimoto. 
The reason why you can develop Crohn's by having gluten sensitivity, people believe that you create this tiny inflammation in the intestine, and if you're genetically predisposed to develop Crohn's as well, that chronic inflammation may instigate and bring you over the edge and make you develop Crohn's. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Over there. What do you think the relationship is between genetically engineered wheat and previous wheat? Have you done any studies with that? I'm not an agronomist, so I have to rely on what my colleague agronomists have done. They've done extensive studies, and again, this is factual. There is no major change in grains in the past 50, 60 years. So the epidemics that we're living is more due to a total change of lifestyle. Uh, we, we use much more antibiotics. I mean, we use more antibiotics at the wazoo, and before they were discovered, we did not. We travel real time from one corner of the world and the other, and we're exposed to different bacteria. We eat differently. Uh, I, you know, when I was a kid, I was telling Ken, I used to eat strawberries in July and, and August, and they came in all sides, all shape, all colors. Now are the same sides, the same color, 12 months a year. You, you know, you wonder what is doing to my guts. So more than the genetic engineer grains, I believe that it's the total environment that is driving these epidemics of immune disease, with diseases. All the way in the back, a gentleman there. No, no, you, you, yep. Um, there was a New York Times article earlier this year by Moises Velasquez, and he was talking about autoimmunity and gluten, and, and he made the point uh, that um, it, it seemed like uh, the intestinal bacteria seem to determine if you're gonna see gluten as a food or, or, or as an enemy. Uh, and my, my question is, are there any studies on humans or animals changing the uh, bacteria in the gut to see if that makes a difference in the eventual gluten sensitivity? Uh, okay, so uh, now that we understand a little bit more in the microbiome, I can really make you nuts, smart, <laughs> thin, fat, um, and sensitive to gluten by changing your microbiome. If you were a mouse, I can do that. Uh, nobody has done this in humans. But all this to say, again, this you know, really support the notion that we are really the component of these two genomes, okay? Yes, ma'am. Uh-uh, microphone. Uh, it's coming. Um, I have a thyroiditis, Hashimoto's, and my doctor who is sitting here today um, feels that if I went on a gluten-free diet that I could cure my Hashimoto's, and yet I tested negative for celiac disease. That's what is right. your feeling? Yeah, I, I mean, it's not because he's here or she's here, but, you know, <laughs> it's partially correct. Uh, you know, um, and I'm going to respond with an anecdote. A colleague of mine from UCLA um, called me up. His daughter has elevated antibodies against the thyroid. It was in the preclinical stage. The kids didn't develop Hashimoto yet. And he looked everything in the literature, and the destiny was that over time, she will have the attack of the toroid and, and lose, you know, the capability to tolerate, you know, uh, to, 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 to have a functional thyroid. So he asked for advice. He said, you know, I read that, you know, gluten can eventually, uh, you know, instigate an immune response that can really touch any organ and tissue, and I have nothing to lose should I put her on a gluten-free diet. And the reason why he was asking, because he tested the kids for celiac disease, was negative, but she tests positive for antibodies against gliadin. And I said, you have nothing to lose. And in three months, the autoantibodies went away. Now, if you already have Hashimoto, so part of your immune, I mean, uh, cells that make the, the, the hormone are gone, uh, that's the done deal. You know, you can't reproduce that cells because while the intestine we can, in the, in the thyroid, at least, you know, now, until we find, you know, a way to, you know, work up, you know, stem cells in the thyroid, you can't make the thyroid to produce more cells that will make the hormones. But definitely, again, this is a long way to answer. There is some reality to this. Now, I want to make another disclaimer. Uh, you know, the gluten-free diet is not a panacea to resolve all the thyroid problems, all the chronic fatigue problems, all, you know, the stuff that goes wrong in the world. You know, these are complex diseases. You know, th those are final destination, like autism, for example. One of the paths that you go there is through the gluten, you know, problem. Those are the ones that will benefit the gluten-free diet. But it would be a mistake 
that is creating a lot of confusion and skepticism among traditional medicine if you say all of them will be resolved with gluten-free diet. You know, this is what we call personalized medicine. There is a group, you need to stratify to find the ones that will eventually problem with gluten, and those will be targeted by the intervention. Time for one last question. Last question, all the way in the back. This may be covered already in your book, so I may be giving something away or taking something away. Um, in your assessment, which test do you believe is the best uh, marker, uh, it, it, be it blood or be it biopsy? Uh, for celiac disease or for celiac disease? Well, again, um, you know, in the past, the, 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 the paradigm to make the diagnosis of celiac disease was to fulfill five criteria. You have signs and symptoms of celiac disease. You have the antibodies test positive. You have to have the HLA, i.e. the genetic compatible. You have to have the damage on the test and show the autoimmune attack. And the symptoms, they need to go away when you embrace a gluten-free diet. 80% of people with celiac disease will fulfill all five criteria. But there are exceptions. There are people that have no symptoms, and yet they have celiac disease. There are rare, 10% of people that may have celiac disease with negative antibodies. Extremely more rare, 1% by people that can have celiac disease without having the proper HLA genes. 10, 15% of the time that we do an endoscopy, we don't find the damage because either the, the lesion is patchy or it's too far for the endoscope to reach. And we know well that some people on a gluten-free diet for months and months, the symptoms will not go away. So there are exceptions. And based on that, we propose, and now it's being embraced by the scientific community, that four out of five criteria will do it. So if you have sinus symptoms, celiac disease, strongly positive antibodies, compatible HLA, you can go on a gluten-free diet without doing the endoscopy. If the symptoms will go away and the antibodies will go away on a gluten-free diet, that diagnosis is confirmed, even if without the endoscopy. But you have to fulfill four out of five criteria. Gentlemen, ladies, it's been a great pleasure, and have a safe holidays, and thank you for coming.